thank you all for joining us. I just want to go over just a few logistical items. This session is being recorded and will be made available on our website. So for that reason, and due to the sheer number of folks in attendance, your lines have been muted. For questions or comments, we'll be using the Q&A feature within Zoom, and we definitely like to encourage you to use that. So feel free to start typing in your questions throughout the session as they come to mind, and our speakers will be typing their responses throughout. And if there's time, we'll select a handful of questions that we will try to cover at the end of today's seminar. So additionally, to give our panelists an understanding of our audience today, please answer a couple of quick questions on your familiarity with the two resources we're going to learn about today, either using the QR code or the Menti link here. And we will put that in the chat as well. So we have a handful of panelists that will be sharing their work and knowledge with us today. We're extremely grateful, not only that they are joining us today, but for the tremendous work that they do supporting this community and pushing the needle forward on preparedness and resilience. So uh, to introduce myself, I'm Terry Martin with the National Alliance for Public Safety, GIS Foundation. Thank you all for joining us for this prep sec talk on decrypting risk, resilience, and social vulnerability data. So Prep Tech Talks are a virtual seminar series where we come together to share the latest resources and innovations and address key challenges in adoption, implementation, and the use of the most effective and advanced technologies, all with a goal of strengthening our collective community, unifying efforts, and building capacity of public safety leaders, first responders, technologists, and GIS practitioners. So I have with me today, Charlotte Abel from the NAPSIC team, who will be assisting with the chat and the Q&A, and Tricia Larson, who will be providing a demonstration following our panelist portion. Our speakers will be addressing your questions via that Q&A, and if time allows, uh, as I mentioned, we'll get to those at the very end. So we also have a fantastic lineup of speakers that I will introduce to you in just a moment. And I'm very excited that you've joined us for our latest Prep Tech Talk. This is part one of a two-part series where we will share data and resources available that your community can leverage today to better understand uh, your community's relative risk, resilience, and vulnerability to hazards. So with that, our objective uh, seems pretty straightforward. Our goal is to continue to decrypt the various indices and indicators available, how you can access them, and select the right one for your project or analysis. So we are very excited to have this tremendous panel of speakers today that are going to help us reach that objective. So with us today, we have Dr. Shane Hubbard from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Daniel Sharp, Contractor Coordinator for the CDC Social Vulnerability Index, and Benjamin Rance with FEMA's National Integration Center. I will do more thorough introductions as we get to the presentation portion, but I wanted to thank them first for being with us today. So here's our agenda. As you can see, it's pretty tight for the hour. And to ensure that our panelists have plenty of time and opportunity for questions, I'm going to get us started with a very brief background on NAPSIG Foundation. So for those of you who are new to our organization, I'd just like to talk briefly about who we are. The National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We have a national network of over 20,000 members, both public safety, and jazz practitioners are like representing local, state, tribal, and county levels. Our organization is governed by an independent board of directors that are primarily public safety practitioners with 30 plus years of experience in the field. We were formed about 15 years ago as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations, some of which you see here, and have evolved into a formal organization over the course of that time. Our vision as an organization is listed here, but at its core is to help build a nation of emergency responders, leaders equipped with the knowledge and skills in applying technology and data to change the outcome of survivors and really working towards building a more resilient nation. So uh, our reach is primarily national with that 20,000 members um, network that I mentioned. And you can see from the map here who is on our webinar today, at least those we were able to geocode based on zip code. Um, this is a pretty good cross-section of the country and a good mix of disciplines and levels of government, as well as the private sector. So 
So our goal is pretty simple. It's really to help get first responders, operators, and decision makers the right actionable information at the right time. And how do we do that? Well, largely through defining and promulgating the consistent use of best practices. And we do this through the development of national guidelines and standards. We work to encourage and foster collaboration. And we do this through regional exercises and simulations. This also helps us to document challenges, what worked well, and further validate and or update guidance based on those activities. And additionally, through education and training like we're doing today, we aim to build the capacity of the community, which is our mission. And finally, we work to transfer that knowledge and skills to the community. And we do this through org to org video, um, video and written tutorials, toolkits, and so on. And show here is our resources page that we provide to support the implementation of standards and best practices and to ultimately transfer that knowledge and those skills. And I would encourage you to visit this page as we do regularly add new tools and resources to support your mission. Additionally, you can find the tool that we'll be sharing at the end uh, on our resources page if you need it at a later date. So next, I'm going to attempt to share, let's see if we have, Charlotte, do we have results yet for the Menti? Can you tell? I am looking. And I am pulling it up right now. Apologies. We do. Okay. The code is in the chat for anyone who would still like to participate. Okay. Now, are you seeing, what are you seeing, Charlotte? Are you seeing the presentation still? I am, yes. Okay, so let me switch that real quick. I apologize. New share two. How's that look? No change. Oh, uh, how about that? Yes. Okay. So helpful. So this is great. So we were hoping that we would have just this, like a good mix of folks who were, had not heard of this, these tools. And so now you're going to become more familiar with them, which is great. And then also get an understanding of if you are familiar, how familiar and where you've used it. So I think this will be really helpful for our speakers today. We'll make sure we share these results with them as well. I'm not sure if it's loading. And maybe not. So maybe we'll have a whole bunch of new folks that become familiar with these tools. So that's pretty exciting. And we'll continue to monitor that and see if we have anything to share in a moment. Let's try this again. How's that look? Back to the slides. Perfect. Okay. So I'm um, moving on. Thank you for allowing me to fumble through my <laughs> switch there. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker who will get us kicked off today. We have with us Dr. Shane Hubbard, who PhD, who is a research scientist at the Space Science and Engineering Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research and disaster science focuses on geospatial modeling approaches that improve decision making that leads to minimizing the impacts from those hazards. And he is also the new chair of the ERISA Community Resilience Task Force. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Shane. All right, thanks, Terry. Well, I'm really excited to be here today to talk about the uh, Community Resilience Committee that we have uh, that's been put together. Committees uh, was put together a couple of years ago as a task force, and because of its uh, number of accomplishments and, and the things that we have going on, it's now uh, been brought into a, a full committee uh, going forward. And the reason we formed this committee, um, because the field of resilience is changing very rapidly. Uh, the, number, the amount of data that's available out there, the research that's going on, it seems like every single day I'm coming across a new uh, bit of research or a new data set or a new website that's available out there. And this information is growing so rapidly, communities just really cannot ingest it 
in a timely manner. And in some cases, they can't get that information, process that, and implement it uh, in a timely manner either. And so uh, communities are struggling, you know, to, where do I find the new information? Where does that exist? Where does the new information live? And then understanding how that applies to their community, how to use it and utilize it, and then to put it in practice. And this is posing a real problem because it's critically important that as communities continue to develop and grow, that they're thinking about uh, resilience strategies to implement within those communities. You know, for example, uh, when we think about topics and natural hazards like flooding, um, these things are evolving and changing. I mean, just even if you leave climate change out of the equation, communities growing impact our floodplains all the time. And knowledge on new resilience strategies is really important and really required uh, as communities continue to grow. And so, you know, not understanding maybe how these floodplains might change in the future um, could really impact um, new developments, uh, new, new infrastructure um, that could potentially be put in places that could be flood, flood prone into the future. And so that is that was the goal um, for our committee to provide information, um, to, to provide materials, best practices, recommendations, to communities as it relates to resilience, to really provide them a place um, in, many in many cases to come and learn more about um, resilience and, and how other communities are handling resilience, new research that's out there, data sets are out there. And we're doing that through workshops, we're doing webinars, white papers. Um, we have some information on the web as well. I'm trying to find as many ways that we can connect with communities to relay this information that we can. And we really wanted to establish RIS as the leader uh, and also in the discussion of, of a producer of knowledge of geospatial data technologies and the policies that community, communities um, for community resilience. So some of the accomplishments um, that we've been able to do here over the past short period of time really so one of the first things that we looked at is developed a community resilience story map. And that story map that goes through information on community resilience, um, tells, tells how communities are approaching resilience. Um, and then the next things that we uh, began to develop are a couple of, one was a, a white paper, um, one was a publication. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bannon Akar published the Redefining Resilience in the Face of a Global Health Crisis for the GIS Professional. And then um, we also published a document titled Responsibly, Supporting the COVID-19 Pandemic Response um, as well. And so those two um, are available out there. You can Google for those and, and take a look at them. Um, and then we've um, also been participating with some of the work that's going to be discussed here, um, helping to look at the risk indices that are available. Uh, one of the challenges has been uh, new risk, risk indices are being developed all of the time. And a lot of these risk indices have different themes, different contexts. They support different, um, uh, different elements of planning. And so we wanted to be involved in that to see how we could help with that learning process and that research that was gonna be uh, put together. And we were participating and trying to help as much as we can with that. And then more recently, uh, we've been participating on URISA's Pandemic Task Force. Um, the Pandemic Task Force is looking at What's interesting about the pandemic uh, in the early stages is there was very little thing, very little going on nationally that was geospatial other than the John, Johns Hopkins website. And um, it was interesting to watch how that began to grow over time as the pandemic became uh, more and more important to track. Something that feels very geospatial like a pandemic, um, there was very little GIS information or geospatial information in, in the early uh, days of that. And so the, the pandemic task force is coming up with strategies for what kind of data sets are, um, are required or available, where to get that, what's, what's the best practices for the data sets as well, and how GIS really can and should be used to support uh, this pandemic event, and of course, future pandemic events as well. And then also supported a public health track for the GIS Pro uh, conference that was held a little bit over a month ago which is a huge success, one of the um, high, more highly attended, um, some of the more highly attended presentations um, uh, that, that we saw at ERISA. So, and then for future directions, some of the things that we're looking at going forward, we're um, doing a couple of new 
uh, two new working groups, the Climate Change and Community Equity Working Group, um, I think it's going to be really important, really just got off, um, uh, jump started here over the last couple of months, GIS, uh, the GS Pro was a, a really nice springboard for that. Um, we've had a lot of interest in that uh, working group. And then the Community Resilience and Sectoral Dependencies Group, that has been moving forward as well. Um, and we're really looking forward to growing both of those working groups. Um, we're also looking at uh, further collaborations nationwide. So we're always trying to engage new people and bring them into the fold and, and see what is it that they're working on community resilience wise and how can we then take that information from those groups and then support not only our ERISA members but the communities that uh, ERISA some supports as well. We're working on quarterly webinars on current topics as well. We should be having a couple of those coming up uh, over the next few months here. Um, and then continue to produce additional articles that will be highlighting uh, community resilience best practices. And we have a couple of those that are uh, also in the works as well that we'll be uh, uh, bringing out and, and bringing forward. So thank you so much. I think this, um, this presentation is, is a great presentation. I think um, what the work that's been uh, done here that's gonna be talked about next is extremely important for communities. And I really look forward to seeing how this uh, then ends up translating uh, into communities and how they can put this into practice. So thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Terry. Thank you, Shane. So the, and I just wanna reemphasize that the work of the ERISA Community Resilience Committee really sparked the effort that led us to the prep tech talk today. Um, and we'll talk more uh, to that at the end. Uh, next, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, and turn it over to our next speaker, Danielle Sharp. Danielle is a geospatial epidemiologist with the Geospatial Research Analysis and Services Program at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and Agency for Toxic Substances Disease Registry in Georgia. In addition to many roles, Danielle is the coordinator for the Social Vulnerability Index Project, an effort at CDC to map the resilience of communities when confronted by external stresses on human health, stresses such as natural or human-caused disasters, or disease outbreaks. And we are extremely grateful for the data you all produced and excited to have you with us today. So with that, I will hand it over to you. Awesome, thank you, Terry. Um, I'm happy to be talking with you all today about the CDC Social Vulnerability Index or CDC SVI for short. Um, but before I get started, I would like to thank the NAPSIG organi organizers for inviting me to this year's Prep Tech Talks. It's um, really an honor um, to be here. Um, so today I will give a, a very brief overview and demonstration of the CDC SVI tool. I will also open up discussion at the end for um, any questions that you all may have um, once the last um, speaker has presented. So let's begin with an overview of CDC SVI. What came to be known as CDC SVI was created in accordance with the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act of 2006, which cited that public health and medical preparedness and response capabilities were critical needs for the nation. When this act was signed into law by then President Bush, it was a mandate to which all federal agencies were tasked to satisfy. CDC decided to build agency capacity by addressing social vulnerability to disasters and public health emergencies. And from this, a group of social scientists and statisticians in my team at CDC began, began developing CDC SVI in 2006 and officially disseminated the first tool in 2011. So every single community in the United States exhibits varying degrees of physical vulnerability to potential disasters. And by this, um, we mean tangible aspects such as the geographic proximity of an area to the source of a hazard, for instance, if a community lies near the coastline. But when we discuss social vulnerability, this is not exactly what we mean. Social vulnerability refers to the demographic and socioeconomic factors that contribute to certain groups of people and communities being more adversely affected when they encounter hazards. 
For instance, there are social factors that lead to certain groups being less prepared for a disaster event, less likely to respond to and recover from such an event, and more likely to suffer total loss of property or be injured or die. Um, the social factors that influence this is what we measure using CDCSVI. Essentially, the purpose of this tool is to assist disaster management and public health officials with identifying the most socially vulnerable populations in their jurisdictions um, over the entire course of the disaster cycle, meaning before, during, and after a hazardous event. CDC SVI is composed of Census Bureau data on 15 different variables that are grouped into four themes, as well as a measure of overall social vulnerability. And these variables include um, uh, data on populations living in poverty, those living with disabilities, with limited English proficiency, even populations living in crowded housing, just to name a few of those variables. The themes of CDC SVI cover four major areas of social vulnerability, including vulnerability on the basis of socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, minority status and language, and lastly, housing type and transportation. The CDC SVI tool is constructed using percentile ranks, which score the relative social vulnerability of areas on a scale of zero to one, with one signifying the highest social vulnerability. We have, de we have developed the CDC SVI tool for the whole US, as well as each state at both the census tract and county levels. We've also developed databases for Puerto Rico and travel tracts. Um, one last thing, we have produced five different databases thus far, and they cover the years of 2000, 2010, 2014, 2016, and 2018, with planned updates for every two years. Also, beginning with the 2014 database, we also include a measure of the medically uninsured population, as well as an estimate of daytime populations. But these particular indicators are not included in the ranking calculations. Here we have the CDC SVI 2018 map in which you can easily distinguish areas of increased social vulnerability across the US and those areas will be in the dark blue. One aspect that makes CDC SVI so unique from other social vulnerability indices is what you see behind the map, which is an example of the database portion of the CDC SVI tool we provide. We not only compute an index and provide maps of percentile ranked social vulnerability, but we also provide the raw data that generate those social vulnerability rankings for each tract and county. And we do this in a freely available and easy, easily accessible um, formats on our website. We also provide prepared county maps for every US county, which display social vulnerability at the census tract level for counties of interest. Our partners really value these maps because they can take a quick glance and get a good idea of the varying patterns of social vulnerability within their own jurisdictions. And so here's an example prepared county map of DeKalb County, Georgia. We see the overall social vulnerability map on the left and maps of the four themes on the right. As you can see, some tracks are highly vulnerable for all four themes and have very high overall social vulnerability. Other tracks are highly vulnerable on only one or more themes or have low vulnerability on all of the themes. Ultimately, these prepared county maps are a useful way to quickly understand the communities that you all serve. And just to speak on the utility of our tool um, briefly, CDC SVI is used by several US state and local governments, as well as several private sector organizations for a variety of purposes. 
For example, our tool has been used to assess social vulnerability through a variety of physical hazards, such as hurricanes, flooding, and tornadoes. Um, CDCSVI has been used to explore social vulnerability in relation to fire outbreaks. It's been used to help plan hazard mitigation, as well as to understand social vulnerability in the context of pathogenic disease outbreaks, such as with the current COVID-19 epidemic. Our tool has also been highlighted in CDC guidance, as shown in this planning for an, an emergency publication. And this guide functions as an aid to emergency managers as it describes the intersection of our population-based CDCSVI tool with the, with the local knowledge of individuals and communities um, that's provided by local public health workers. And more recently, we've seen CDCSVI used under non-emergency conditions, such as for public health allocation budgets and um, a variety of research studies on chronic diseases. Now, I will quickly demo the CDC SVI website and how you can access this tool. And so when we come here um, to this link that I believe will be shared with everyone on this call, you um, will see the website for the CDC um, SVI tool. Um, we provide quite a, a lot of information, for example, here to the left, we provide a fact sheet, um, some information on our tool at a glance. We have our data and documentation download um, tab, an interactive map tab, the publications and materials, and frequently asked questions. Um, one of the, the tabs that you may be most interested in will be this data and documentation download tab which is where you can find all of the, the databases that we've created. Um, and so here, if we, if we want to um, look at data, we can decide which year of the databases we would be interested in. Um, we can pick a, a geography that we're interested in. And so this will give you all US states. Um, so I'll click United States here. And then you can come here and pick your geography type. You can choose census tracts if you're more so interested um, in communities or counties if you're more so interested um, in some sort of um, planning activity. And then, and so I'll select counties here. And then lastly, you select your file type. So if you're going to be using some sort of GIS software, you'll want to download the shape file. Um, if you more so want to just get a, a, an understanding of the data you can select the CSV file. And then once you press go, you'll get your download. Um, before I go to, to show you what the download looks like, I also want to show you all that we provide documentation for all of our databases. Um, and so once you uh, download our data, you'll be able to come and, and look at um, the metadata for what all of those different variables mean. And so just to give you an idea, this is an example of a CSV file for the United States CDC SVI database for um, the year 2018. Here at the top, we have um, our variable names and then you have the data that fall below. Um, although within our database, it's not highlighted, I wanted to highlight this to, to give you a, a good idea of what we're uh, looking at. And so, we have these E underscore variables. These are going to be our estimates. These are those raw counts that I mentioned that can help you with um, planning how to allocate various resources. And then if we continue to scroll, we'll come to um, these data that are highlighted in blue here. And these are our EP variables. These are going to be um, percentages um, that you may be um, also interested in. But ultimately, for those who are interested in mapping, we have these EPL and RPL variables. And these are essentially um, the index portion of the um, CDC SVI tool. And so here, um, for example, if we look at EPL age 17 and under, 
um, you can you can see these indices that rank from that range from zero to one, and the closer um, a, a data point is to one, the more socially vulnerable that area is. And so to hop back to the, to the website, you may also be interested in looking at our interactive map, which we also provide um, those prepared county maps on. And so if we go here, where I already have the um, interactive map pulled up, we scroll in. Um, right now, you're looking at the CDC SVI database at the county level, but the further you zoom in, you'll be able to see census tracts. But just to give you an idea um, of, of um, the data we provide, for example, if I click here on Appling County, Georgia, I can see that in the year of 2016, um, Appling County was very socially vulnerable in comparison to all other counties in the US. We can see here that um, this county has an SVI score of 0.9433. And we can inter interpret that as Appling County being more socially vulnerable um, than 94% of um, all other counties in the US. And so um, I also mentioned the publications and materials page. Um, if you're ever interested in hosting your own webinar highlighting our tool, we do provide training um, videos on YouTube here that introduce CDC SVI as well as the methods that we use to construct our tool. We also provide um, publications such as the seminal publication here where we introduce the CDC Social Vulnerability Index and that was led by Dr. Barry Flanagan, who is still with the team today. We also provide um, different materials from the um, community um, in terms of uh, state partners, regional, local partners, and what they've done with our CD CDC SVI tool. For example, um, Esri has promoted our tool um, quite a lot. Um, the, the Sergo Foundation has also promoted our tool within their customized COVID community vulnerability index. And we have a, a range of, of different partners who have used our tool and, and who are publicly um, presenting that and, and how they're using it. So I will end there with the presentation. And as a wrap up, um, just to reiterate, um, our CDC SVI tool measures 15 different social factors that truly capture um, the concept of social vulnerability. And this helps uh, a variety of partners across the US to identify their most socially vulnerable communities. Um, this tool measures social vulnerability on a scale of zero to one, with one being most vulnerable. And we do this for census tracts and counties across the US. And lastly, um, CDC SVI is useful for assisting communities in need in the context of disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. So across the entire disaster cycle. So I'll stop there and um, I'm happy to take questions um, once all the presenters um, have gone. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Danielle. Uh, we generally appreciate your, the work you do. This has been incredibly insightful to hear you explain the attributes and geographies included and how to navigate the resources that CDC provides and uh, in particular the examples from the community and the type of work it has been used for. So thank you so very much. Uh, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker that we were also very thrilled to have, uh, Benjamin Rantz, who is a management and program analyst in the technical assistance branch of the National Integration Center. He is the project lead for the Community Resilience and Recovery Technical Assistance Project and the agency lead for the Resilience Analysis and Planning Tool, or RAPT. 
He started working at FEMA in August of 2019. And prior to that, he had over six years of experience working for the Peace Corps, both overseas and in Washington, DC. Benjamin holds a master's degree in national resource management and geography from, from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And he received his undergraduate degree in environmental studies from Western Michigan University. Thank you so much for being with us today, Benjamin. I will turn it over to you. Hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, again, my name is Benjamin Rance. I'm working at the National Immigration Center at FEMA. I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about the resilience analysis and planning tool. And I just really want to thank NABSIG for the opportunity to, to discuss with everybody and present a little bit about what we've been able to do with the tool and kind of walk people through it and really just provide an intro as to, to what it can do. Um, so again, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, and we're just going to kind of dive right into it. Um, so what is the resilience analysis and planning tool? Um, it's a publicly available GIS tool, and we really see it as an opportunity to help inform strategies for preparedness, response, and recovery. Um, it is free and available to the public, um, which is one of the things that I think is one of the benefits of the tool. And it's a, a combination of, of three different types of data, I would say. Um, it's population and community data, it's infrastructure data and hazard data. And all of this data is open source and available to the public. Um, going into those three different types of data, we have our 20 commonly used community resilience indicators. And we're gonna talk about how we got to that number of 20 community resilience indicators on the next slide. And we combine that with infrastructure data from the Homeland Infrastructure Foundation level data, um, high field. Um, this is their open and public data set um, and then we also have hazard layers. So we talk about historic data, risk data, and we actually have some real-time severe weather forecast layers as well that we were able to add um, after collaborating with our friends at the National Weather Service. Um, you combine those three aspects of data um, with some, I believe, uh, that are user-friendly interactive analysis tools um, and the ability to add your own data to the tool temporarily. Um, and I think it's, it's a really powerful tool. So I just want to talk a little bit about how we got to the 20 commonly used community resilience indicators. So in 2018 and 2019, FEMA paired with Argonne National Labs to conduct a literature review of all of the different methodologies um, that were related to identify commonly used indicators of community resilience. Um, and this literature review produced um, about 73 distinct methodologies. Um, these are all methodologies that were um, published between 2013 and 2018. Um, and so within those 73 different methodologies, you know, we really wanted to focus on specific criteria. So if you look at box number three um, in the light blue box next to it, you can see the six criteria that were kind of generated from FEMA on what we wanted to focus on. Again, this tool was originally developed to help us identify areas of priority need within the United States and the territories um, in terms of where we can identify areas that need help with community resilience, um, maybe what specific type of support they could use um, so we could then actively engage with them. Um, so you can see the six different criteria that we have right there in the upper right-hand corner. After um, creating and applying those inclusion criteria, it actually reduced the number of methodologies we had down to eight. And you can see those listed in the bottom left. And I'm very happy to say um, that the social vulnerability index uh, is actually one of those that we actually looked at. You can also see maybe a couple of the different um, uh, tools for indicators that uh, you probably recognize as well. Um, and then within those eight different indices and within those eight methodologies that we have, we really wanted to look at those community resilience indicators that were mentioned in at least three of them, because this indicated some agreement amongst the scientists and the researchers that, um, that they were pretty consistently important for community resilience. So once we looked at those that were listed in at least three of the eight methodologies, that's how we got to our 20 commonly used indicators. And then you'll see visually, um, we actually bend those indicators for visual display and for uh, export to different CSV and Excel files as well. So if we, when we go to the next slide, we can see the two left columns, which are the commonly used indicators from our community resilience indicator analysis. You see the com column on the left are the population focused indicators, uh, generally focused on um, individuals within the, the community. And then you see the second column is our community focused indicators. These are typically focused on aspects of the community. 
Um, again, this information comes from the American Community Survey. Um, we actually, our values in wrapped are the five-year averages for these, um, and we use the years 2014 to 2018, since that's uh, the most up-to-date data that we have so far. Um, and so that's where we get the information and the data for these different commonly used indicators and the two left columns. Uh, the third column you can see is a list of all of the infrastructure data that we have. Again, this is pulled from Highfield, their open source platform. And then on the right column, you can see our hazard data. You can see our historic and risk data. And we also have different layers, uh, data layers that we get from NOAA and the National Weather Service. So combining all three of those sets of information give us the resilience analysis and planning tool. So I'm actually going to go through and share my screen and go to the resilience analysis and planning tool website really quickly and kind of show you a little bit about what it looks like. So you can see the resilience analysis and planning tool. The first thing I wanted to mention is we do have a website um, that will actually uh, get you a link to the tool and a whole bunch of other supporting documents. It is very easy to get to. If you type in fema.gov slash RAPT, it will actually get you to this website. There's a big blue box right here, how you can access the tool, which we're gonna look at in a couple minutes. Um, and then as you scroll down, you can actually see a bunch of different training resources. We have an hour long PowerPoint that we've recorded, which goes through step-by-step -step all of the different aspects of the tool for an overview webinar. Um, we also have how-to tutorial videos that we've actually filmed record it anywhere between seven and 13 or 14 minutes long that break down each aspect of the tool. So you can kind of watch those in bite-sized chunks to learn a little bit more about the different aspects of it. And we actually have supporting documents on the bottom as well. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out right here is that we actually have the full community resilience indicator analysis uh, report. So if you are interested in the methodology um, and the steps that we took to get to those 20 community resilience indicators, please feel free to read this whole report. It has a lot of great information in it. So I'm gonna to go to the tool now that we have a couple minutes left. So you can see um, it looks uh, very similar to what the SVI tool um, looks like. I wanna point out a couple of things. Um, on the left, you'll see kind of a collapsible sidebar. Um, this again has links to all of our documents and supporting documents. It has a list of FAQs. These are about the functionality of the tool and about where we got our information. Um, so I encourage everybody to read through the FAQs. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's an email address uh, for our TA request email inbox that I monitor daily. Um, so if you do have any questions or we'd love to get feedback um, on the tool, please feel free to contact us at that email box down there. I get into the tool just a little bit. Um, and so we're gonna focus on a specific area. Um, you'll see a couple different things. Um, in the upper right, we have a number of tabs. Uh, the first couple tabs kind of provide an overview and methodology and some background information on the tool that you can see. We have each of the 20 indicators listed here along with their connection to resilience. So not only does it say what the data set is, where it comes from, the American Community Survey five-year estimates for these five years, it talks about the national average, and it also lists some of the connections that this specific indicator has to resilience. So I encourage anybody who is just taking a look at the tool for the first time um, to take a look at those indicators. So what I want to do is I want to zoom into a specific area just so we can kind of take a look um, at what this tool visually looks like and some of the tools within the wrapped. So I'm just going to zoom into the Tampa Bay area just because it kind of gives us a, a really good view of some of our hazard layers um, specifically in this area and also some really good demographic information in terms of the community resilience indicators that we're looking at. So if we're zooming in right here, um, we should be able to see uh, this little peninsula right here and we can kind of see Tampa Bay. So I'm gonna go through and I wanna toggle on a couple of things first. Um, the first thing is you'll notice in the upper right, we have all of our FEMA regions broken out. We have two per tab. Um, this is because the data in wrapped is available at the county level and at the census tract level. And there are about 74,000 census tracts in the United States. And so in order to only load um, a certain amount uh, at a time, we actually load them per FEMA region. So Florida is in FEMA region four. So if we click on the tab for regions three and four, you'll see a number of different toggle boxes that we can have toggled on and off. And then we also have all of the, the 13 indicators that we have available at the census tract data for region three. And if we keep scrolling down, you'll see the indicators we have available for region four. So if we click on, let's say we wanna look at age 65 and older, if we click on that name, 
Uh, it'll expand into the legend below, and you'll see it's a very similar color scheme to the SBI. And when we toggle that layer on, you'll actually see at the census track level, each census track color corresponds to the percentage of individuals who are age 65 and over. So let's say we wanted to zoom in on this uh, somewhat dark blue census track here. When we click on each census track, you'll actually have a pop-up box um, and it'll have two different tabs. One will have the information for the specific uh, indicator that we're looking at. So for instance, for this census tract, it has the population age 65 and older as 36.4%. So you can see it's relatively high in this census tract. And another tab that's also pops up when we click on it is it has the 13 census tract level indicators and all of their information right here. So for instance, for this census tract right here, you can see it's about 3,200 people live there. And we have every value for the, the, the data that's available at the census tract level for these indicators. So we can see the percentage age over 65 is 36.4. The percentage with a disability is 27.3. And you can kind of go on down the line and take a look. Um, and this is true for every census tract. So if we click on another census tract, then we have all of this information available for them as well. So we can do this for multiple different indicators as well. So let's say we looked at age, um, let's say we wanted to look at disability, we'll expand that and then we'll take a look at the map as well. You can kind of see visually this is represented differently. And again, if we click on any of the census tracts, we have the pop-up box that tells us what the specific value is for this indicator, as well as all the values for the 13 indicators that we have available at the census tract level. A couple of things with this, we can also take a look at all of this information in tabular form. So for instance, for disability, if I click on these three uh, circles and I wanna say view this in the attribute table, it will actually pull up for all of the census tracts that we can see on the screen that are in region four. It'll pull up the information for each of the census tracts with all of the indicator values. Um, so you can see for this census tract, if we scroll over, we can see population, percentage age, percentage over 65, disability, lack of high school diploma, and all of these. Um, you can also take this, if you click on the options button and export to CSV, this will export to an Excel file. So you can actually use that um, in tabular form, not just uh, visually. I also wanna take a look at some of the other layers that we have. So these are some of the indicators that we discussed. Um, I wanna take a look at the infrastructure layers. So if you click on the infrastructure tab, you'll notice if you click on an infrastructure entity, it gives you the legend below. And when you toggle it on, you'll actually see that indicator pop up on the screen. You see all these red dots. And so each of these correspond to a hospital that's listed in the high field data set. By clicking on one of those, you'll actually get information for the specific entity. It tells you the number of beds, where it's located. It tells you, um, sometimes it will tell you what the highest level of trauma it is, if it has a helipad or not. So you can see this as we click on different ones, you get more information available. Again, this information is pulled from high field. So sometimes if we have an incomplete data set, um, we'd have to reach out to Highfield to update it since we aren't, we don't own this data. We're just pulling it from Highfield. And again, you can toggle a number of these on at once. So let's say we wanted to look at hospitals and public schools. You can see the orange dots are public schools. Clicking on these will actually tell us what school it is. It tells you how many students are enrolled, what grades they are, pre-K through fifth grade, how many teachers there are, the location. Um, so I think this is, this is really beneficial um, and I'm gonna show you a tool that we have as well. Um, after I show you just one quick hazard, if we, if we click on the hazards, you can see all of the hazards that we have listed here, as well as at the bottom, we have listed some of our real time hazard data taken from the National Weather Service. Um, one of the ones that we like to look over here, it might take a little bit to load, but just the flood hazard zones. If we toggle the flood hazard zones on, um, eventually you'll see around here in all the different areas, uh, will turn either you know blue or orange or yellow depending on whether there's a one percent annual chance of a flood or a 0.2 percent so uh, one every 100 year flood or one every 500 year flood um, this layer because when we turn on hazard layers it pulls for the entire united states does take a little while to load which is why we can't necessarily see a loading right now um, but just in the interest of time i want to kind of continue just to show uh, one of the tools we have for this. Oh, here it pops up a little bit. You can see a little bit right here, the blue and the brown areas. So then what we can do is, you know, while we're taking a look at this flood hazard layer, we can go back to our infrastructure layers, toggle on our public schools, and you can actually see 
which public schools or any of these infrastructure entities really are located within some of these hazard zones. Um, I want to turn the flood hazard layer off really quickly and show you one tool, and then I promise I will turn it back to everybody at NAPSIG. Um, one of the tools we have is an incident analysis tool um, that I just clicked on in this upper right corner. You can actually see some of the tools that we have available. Um, what the incident analysis tool allows us to do is actually set a, a specific point and a buffer zone around it. Um, and then by selecting different infrastructure entities, it will tell us how many of those infrastructure entities are within that area. And I really think this is great um, for evacuation planning and exercises. So for instance, let's say there was an incident right here at the crossroads, right here. You can see all of our um, infrastructure entities listed at the bottom. And let's say we wanted to look at mobile home parks. It actually, when we click on it, it shows us a dot for every mobile home park that's located within this buffer zone. Not only does it show us which ones are located and they number them um, from closest to the epicenter to furthest away, it gives us a list right here and we can also download this list and export it to Excel. So lots of uh, powerful data. We can do the same for public schools if you click on this. Again, I think this is really important for emergency managers who are thinking about evacuation planning and purposes. Um, let's say you have an incident right here and you need to evacuate everybody within a five mile radius. This tells you how many infrastructure entities you have and you can go through and click on different. Um, so it tells you public health departments. It will tell us how many hospitals, um, really anything that we want to look at. Um, so uh, I, I know I'm getting short on time, so I wanted to turn this over, but um, I'm just going to go back to our slides really quickly. Um, and just kind of take a look at some of the benefits of it. Um, I really think all these tools and these indices, um, you know, the wraps, uh, it's user friendly. Um, you can use it for a community resilience profile. You can see how we can support emergency managers, whether it's through the FIRA SPR or different exercises, prioritized areas for evacuation like we discussed. And I really think that although there are a lot of similarities between the tool, I think each one is very unique and diverse. And I really think that they all exist um, to be complementary to each other. I think there is an appropriate use for all of them. And I think that together as a whole, they can all kind of be used to, to really help and emergency managers have a better understanding of their communities. So um, with that, I will turn it back over. Um, I went over a little bit, so I'm sorry, but I don't know if there's any questions and I'll, I will turn it back over to Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. I, I really appreciate your presentation today. I first became aware of CREA a couple years ago and have really been just impressed by uh, the evolution of the RAP tool in particular um, and all of the capabilities that you continue to add. And like the CDC, you've done an excellent job with all the resources you have made available to help folks understand the methodology and how to navigate, interact and with the, all the different functionality it provides. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanna do a quick check. Trish, uh, Trisha or Charlotte, are you seeing my screen okay before I- Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. So with that, um, I just wanna give a very brief intro before Trisha does a, a live demonstration. I'm really excited to share with you uh, a collaborative initiative between the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation and Eurysis Community Resilience Now Committee. So it was a little less than a year ago, we formed a focus group of academia, emergency managers and planners, public safety leaders, geospatial technologists and R&D experts in this space. Members represented all parts of the country and levels of government and to include the private sector. And the group was formed after questions continued to arise on the from the projects at NAPSIG and the members of the Community Resilience Task Force were involved in their respective agencies, as more indices and indicators of risk and vulnerability became known, um, we were all trying to understand which might be better suited for different uh, projects and use cases. And we recognized if we were having these questions, other folks might too. So we formed this group. Uh, NAPSIG did a bunch of research uh, on the available indices. We ended up narrowing it down to about five for at least this initial round um, to, that were nationally and publicly available with the exception of the NRI, which as of this week, phase one has been uh, released. Um, so we did a bunch of research. We brought this focus group together to try to understand what the community might ask of these indices. 
I'm going to go to the next slide, um, what they might care about to help them decipher which to use. So this was, we started about over a year ago. And since then, um, they helped us identify the questions, create, uh, decide what those answers were. We've gotten some feedback from each of like the folks on the call today. And um, so we've developed this tool that we hope will help folks at least start to understand the different methodologies, the variables behind them, and when you might want to use one versus the other, depending on what variables you're most interested in for your community or the geography. So with that, I will stop sharing and I'll let Trisha go ahead and show the tool. I know we're down on time, so she'll show it quickly. I'll let you share. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you, Terry. Um, let's see here. All right, are you guys seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, okay, perfect. So as Terry mentioned, this guidance was developed with the Eurisic Community Resilience Committee to help the community better understand the risk, resilience, and vulnerability um, indices and indicators available today. And the tool is a living document and we are currently working with the data stewards and the community to refine the content and ensure its relevance to the mission at hand. So if any of you have used any of these indices and indicators, we'd love your feedback to help inform future iterations of this tool. So currently we have an overview comparison of the five indices, a variables comparison, as well as um, detailed views of four of the indices. So we have CDC, SBI, um, SOVI, CRIA, as well as BRIC. And the National Risk Index was actually a uh, phase one released last night. So we will be updating an index page for them very, very soon. So I'll jump into a little bit here, but our um, overview comparison chart provides a quick kind of bird's eye view of the various indices and indicators with some information like granularity, coverage, um, some descriptions and some outputs. And then if you want to take a deeper dive into the variables, um, we have them listed out in this chart here. And the variables that you'll see here in the same row, just a heads up, we are putting them in the same row to denote that they are similar. And this is simply for visualization purpose, purposes. So we are not indicating that the variables listed in the same rows here are identical. We're just trying to provide some visualization to help you understand how the index or indicator kind of arrived at its output. So once you kind of take a bit of a look at each of these different indices, you can jump into our index details pages. So on each of the index details pages, we're providing some of that overview information as well as a deeper dive into how to access each of the data sets, um, some context behind why the data steward had developed the data and the index, um, their intended audience, their um, envision on how the indice or index would be used, uh, limitations, as well as a bit of an overview on variables. And then we're also providing some supplemental information and some contact pages for each of the different indices and indicators. So that is a very quick rundown of our guidance on risk, resilience, and vulnerability indices. And I will stop sharing and turn back over to Terry. Awesome. I am going to share and start to wrap us up here. Thank you all for holding on for the last couple minutes here. We will, if it's not already, we'll make sure we put the link to the tool in the chat so you can explore it further. I know Trisha just tried to give you a really quick rundown of what that looks like today. Um, so where do you go from here? So our call to action to you is to continue to become more familiar with what's available out there. So we have the link to the CDC website, the CREA RAP tool, um, and then the tool itself that we have combined all of the different uh, variables for each of these together, try to do it all in one place. 
We'd love to hear your feedback on the tool if you're using these and how and why. Uh, we're, I think that the data owners were also interested to hear that as well. So uh, that's where we would like you to go next. Um, from there, I'm going to click to the next slide. Here we go. So what's next? As I mentioned, this is part one of part two. We are hoping for part two to take place in February. Um, and we would use that time to share with you the NRI and Sylvie and Brick. Uh, so we will be putting that information out as soon as we finalize the date. We're very excited about that. And then Inspire, if you receive our newsletter, you may have heard that it is now a virtual uh, event. We're very excited that we still get to have it and we're developing all of the information on that and we will put that out as well in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye out for that. If you uh, are interested in more information on any of our events, you go to the event page and we publish all of our recordings and materials from any of these sessions. So um, feel free to check back there for the session materials from today and previous events. However, since you've registered, you will get notification that um, when these materials are ready to go. So I want to thank one last time to all of our speakers for their great work. Um, I know you're all incredibly busy, so appreciate your time um, today and sharing really, really good descriptions and insightful um, experiences into each of these tools. So thank you so very much for that. Thanks to all of our uh, attendees today for being with us today. We hope this was helpful. Please reach out if you have additional thoughts or questions. Our presenters did a really good job at answering the Q&A uh, throughout, which is good because we're running over on time, but we will publish that with our material. So you can look forward to reading their answers to all of the questions you had. Thank you again for your time. We hope to see you at a future prep tech talk. Take care.